Somebody saw her earlier this morning. Oh, yeah. She sent me a video. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. She sent me a video of, like, it was uh, uh, um, no pages on the back of the program. <laughs> Oh, okay. yeah. Video, this oh, yeah. She was like, she was like, I have such a good idea for a video. She got this like, th yeah, that thing, and then she, and then she, it was like the sound, and yeah, and then it was the sound of my thesis printing, and she overlaid the two, and I, I was like so like, I've never had such a visceral reaction to the video, <laughs> and I cried, and I was like horrified, and like really, it was really disturbing. <laughs> Like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I'm not gonna talk about it. <laughs> but like, she subjected me to that. She thought it was nice. And she thought it was it's nice. She, she gave it to me as like a gift for when she went to eat. And I was like, oh my god. But she should be making more videos. I think she really thrives on the form of the magnet, the fridge magnet. Honestly, yeah, it's convenient. It really is. Walmart has a, a ledger of all of them. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Can you send us? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm your moderator, Taryn Tanum. We have some great presentations. Um, Elizabeth Newton is on her way. Um, we're going to start with uh, Paula Harper's Unmute This, Ubiquitous Listening and Vernacular Media Theory. Um, unfortunately, Meredith Graves could not make it today, um, but that gives our presenters more time and some more time for questions, which will be really great. Um, so please, if you're watching this on the live stream, please use the uh, hashtag uh, for TTW16, as well as hashtag B5 uh, for the I think that's a five. Yeah, that was an S for a second. Uh, hashtag B5. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to make sure uh, so we can ask your questions. And we'll follow it up with Alexandra Malatkow's How to Love Music That Hates You. Uh, so um, I'm going to hand this over to Paula, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Thank you. Yeah, you will sit there. I will sit over here. Or can, is this audible? Is this audible? That's audible. Okay. Um, well, since we have a couple of extra minutes, I just want to say that I'm super excited to be here. Um, and it's been an excellent, amazing conference so far. Uh, so thanks to the organizers, thanks to all of the um, people who are here presenting papers and asking great questions. Um, I'm full of positive energy. So uh, let's get this, my personal show on the road here, I guess. Um, <laughs> All right, you're scrolling through a social media feed, casting glances at pictures, GIFs. I heard from the last panel that we were pronouncing it GIF and that was okay, so I'm gonna go with that. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, pictures, GIFs, emojis, chunks of text. Your finger drags across a post containing a video that begins to play automatically. Maybe a dancing bearded lizard or a baby bobbing its head. Maybe the video doesn't catch your attention until you've nearly passed it. Or maybe you watch the video through once before noticing beneath the frame of the video, but still part of the post, well, I guess above in this case, um, still part of the post is a frantic, excited, all caps injunction. OMG, unmute this immediately. The video, after all, is running silently, a series of moving images without sound. You're now faced with a choice. Do you trust the judgment of the person who posted the video? Do you pop in your earbuds or momentarily pause your streaming radio and turn on this video's sound? Perhaps you do, and moments later, you're smiling, giggling, even reposting the video with an appended caption of your own. The above hypothetical moment, what I will call in this paper the unmute this directive, might seem like an innocuous, mundane encounter. But I'm going to suggest instead today that this particular intersection of behavior, devices, and content functions as an entry point into a number of broader considerations surrounding 21st century media and use. First, this moment elucidates a reframing of the digital sensorium, how ears and eyes, watching and listening, are configured and reconfigured in tandem with ubiquitous devices like smartphones and earbuds, and via the affordances and behaviors of various platforms. Secondly, the Unmute This directive points to a distinct mode of online socialization, a particular sociality of social media. In collaboration with the devices and platforms of their everyday experience, users build a vernacular theory of media use based on their own behaviors and practices. They then implement that theory while seeking to impart an ideal content experience for others, platform users potentially far removed from the poster or commenter's own acquaintances. In this paper, then, I'll begin by unpacking the implementation of autoplaying video, sketching out some patterns in the form and content of unmute this tagged videos. I'll then discuss the sensory behaviors and practices that map onto dealing with autoplaying video, at least as are suggested by the unmute this directives. Then I'll suggest what I mean by vernacular media theory and unpack some implications for the kinds of assumptions about sociality, authority, and trust that are built into such theorizing and into user responses to it. So in December of 2013, Facebook instituted a platform change so that videos on a user's Facebook feed began, began auto-playing. That is, as a user scrolled past a video contained in a post on her feed, that video would begin to play automatically without input or interaction from the user, apart from the initial action of scrolling to or past the video. This video autoplay functionality has since been taken up by numerous other hosts of video content, platforms like Tumblr, Instagram, Vine, uh, as well as various other sites. 
In a 2015 piece for Digiday, Eric Blatberg credits Facebook's implementation with catalyzing this broader change, uh, declaring autoplaying video now, quote, ubiquitous in the platform world, despite having developed from, quote, the most hated digital ad tactic. <laughs> Crucially, however, and perhaps the difference between hatred and ubiquity, uh, Facebook's videos only automatically play their visual track at the instigation of the user's scroll. The default state for autoplaying audio is off, mute. In response, then, to this ubiquitous functionality, the unmute this directive is a user-generated paratextual practice. That is, a practice of creating surrounding informative material external but referential to a particular text or media object. I also find it useful to think of Unmute This posts themselves as a genre of video posts, adopting Franco Fabri's definition of musical genre for my own usage. Fabri's musical genre is, quote, a set of musical events, real or possible, whose course is governed by a definite set of socially accepted rules. My internet video genre is a set of audiovisual and or textual events, real or possible, whose course is governed by a definite set of socially acceptable rules. And by course, um, I'm making that broad to uh, include both the unfolding of the video, the unfolding of the experience of watching and listening to the video, and the course of the video's circulation and markup via captions, comments, tagging, etc. Unmute this videos as a genre tend to share certain audiovisual characteristics related by a single notion that the audio component isn't just vestigial, but that these videos are fundamentally audiovisual objects. Videos that acquire the unmute this directive via user captions are understood to be incomplete in their visual parameters alone. They are usually short, oftentimes but not always cross-platform reposts of six-second vines. Sometimes their visuals are bizarre or utterly banal. Um, importantly, they could make sense as visual-only objects, things that viewers might conceivably pass by and consume with only their eyes. Here, uh, a Tumblr user sums up uh, what I'm assuming, I'm assuming this is a sincere thank you for Unmute This Directives. Uh, he otherwise would have confused them for GIFs. However, while Unmute This Directives accompany videos that might not initially seem to require an audio component, the form, in fact, thrives on powerful juxtaposition. In a sonic surprise reveal, an unexpected pairing of sound and image delights an audience member, producing an entirely different experience than the visual-only object did. So let's show some. Um, so here uh, we have an enthusiastic dog. He's very happy. <laughs> Um, it turns out that he's been dancing to Toto's Africa. Uh, so the quick percussion beat syncs with his steps, and the clip's musical and fits nicely into its beginning, so you can really just watch this over and over and over again. Believe me, I have while preparing for this paper. Um, uh, here we have a uh, happily frolicking llama. So he's so pleased. Um, who it turns out <laughs> dancing to DMX, the DMX hit party up in here. Uh, since we have extra time, I added this one back in. Uh, this is Kanye dancing at the VMA, the 2015 VMAs. Uh, but in this particular rendition, what he's dancing to is the Rugrats theme. <laughs> And this one loops really well. <laughs> um, and then uh, this one, which is particularly good, which really just looks like an adorable gif of a cute hedgehog running around. Um, and someone has then cleverly uh, punned it by putting, <laughs> that's right, the uh, Sonic the Hedgehog theme um, over this little uh, quickly running hedgehog. So. Um, Man, I wish we could just watch that all day. Um, the, the aforementioned effects of Sonic Surprise rest, of course, on an assumption that someone encountering the, an unmute this caption would have behaved in a certain way. Beginning as a viewer only, she would have seen at least a portion of the video, if not the whole thing, with the audio off, before electing, perhaps via the advice of an unmute this commenter, to turn on the sound. While this might seem clear and intuitive to us, uh, after watching all of those, it actually points to a surprising swap of the sensorium, or how we tend to think of how the senses work. 
In his book, The Audible Past, media historian and sound studies scholar Jonathan Stern enumerates what he calls, quote, the audiovisual litany, an array of binaries that tend to frame modern Western thinking about the differences between viewing and listening, seeing and hearing, that are, quote, often considered as biological, psychological, and physical facts. The implication being that they are a necessary starting point for the cultural analysis of sound. Stern's litany is extensive, but some of the central assumptions that he points out are that hearing is immersive and automatic, while vision is perspectival and elective. Hearing is always on. There are no lids for our ears to shut out or stop our reception of sound. The Unmute This Directive suggests a flipped set of circumstances, an ecosystem in which vision is always being passively engaged, but hearing is discretionary and must be actively singled out. One's fullest attention, it is assumed, is a listening rather than viewing attention. In identifying this particular sensory paradigm and responding to it, Unmute this directors are deploying what I call a vernacular media theory in which non-institutional users respond to institutionally imposed forms and protocols using their own experiences and behaviors as predictive, abstractable models for the behavior and experiences of other users. I'm drawing my vernacular media theory formulation from another number of recent theorizations of vernacular practice, um, including Robert Glenn Howard's theories of vernacularism in digital spaces, Howard suggests the web's potential as a locus of vernacular participation for transformative public discourse, but rather than a pure vernacular, Howard charts what he calls a dialectic vernacular in which institutional and non-institutional practices and protocols inform each other dynamically. Metatextual practices like the Unmute This Directive reveal and in some ways work to resolve dissonances between institutional and user ideas of platform use and experience. Adding an unmute this caption is an outward facing community serving behavior in which a user seeks to help other users achieve an ideal entertainment experience, one that she herself has had. Here uh, we have just a couple of uh, Tumblr text posts <laughs> suggesting the ways in which, or, sorry, suggesting the ways that these tags function, both from the standpoint of posters for that first one um, and of viewers for the other two. Again, I'm assuming that these all are meant in earnest. Um, the behavioral response from users encountering the Unmute This dir Directive is then based on various evaluations of trust and authority, a judgment call on whether the full audiovisual experience will be worthwhile. After all, unmuting the video might involve interrupting some other multitask listening experience. Determinations of an Unmute This post's worthwhileness depend on further metatextual information, like numbers of views and reposts, quantities of unmute this captions, or the identity of the poster or reposter, and an evaluation of that person's taste and sense of humor. A particular sociality, a set of relations that are enacted, assumed, and acted upon is made visible in this genre of post. Of course, I'm not positing that this strand of sociality, this set of behaviors and texts, is utterly utopian or some kind of powerful anti-institutional site of resistance. After all, the vernacular media theory in question frames a content delivery mode, autoplaying video, that was originally developed as a potent digital ad strategy. Additionally, the Unmute This Directive is often used as a tactic by online content producers who are hoping to capture and cultivate an audience whose viewership can be transmuted into capital, say, in the framework of Brooke Duffy's aspirational labor. Uh, expressions of frustration with the overuse of Unmute This Directives occur with about as much frequency as, as expressions of pleasure or gratitude. Um, and we can see a couple of examples here. Um, so instead of naive techno-utopianism, then, I simply wish instead to use this genre of post to suggest ways in which institutional mandates and vernacular behavior co-constitute legible hybrid forms. The directive of Unmute This hovers somewhere within the established articulated structures of its platforms, a sensible and personal communication from and to savvy users <coughs> whose eyes are always on and whose fingers are always scrolling, but who must elect to flip the switch for their ears. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. We're going to have some questions at the end. Remember to please use the TTW hashtag and hashtag B5. Um, Elizabeth's going to get her presentation set up, and then we're going to hear from Alex, and we'll have some time for some questions in here. And if you tweet your questions, I'm going to try and get them to them on here, and uh, we'll also be able to address them uh, while we're, uh, if you're watching the live stream. Um, great. Thanks for your patience. I'm Elizabeth. I'm going to talk about music streaming. Um, so music is material. Sound can be touched, weighed, and measured. Music is made through labor using skill and instruments. Musical content is information, takes up time and space in the sky and underwater. Sound is a vibration, provides physical relief and pleasure. And sound, when used as a weapon of torture, has force that can do damage. And yet, despite this tangibility, music is widely perceived as immaterial, as inexplicable and mysterious, the epitome of the ephemeral and fleeting. The stream, the means by which most of us here consume a lot of our music today, reinforces this perception through a metaphor. A stream is constantly flowing, with new information passing by at every moment. The source of a stream is hidden and far away, usually, and the stream's destination, the sea, feels infinite. Metaphors, such as the stream, are often understood, understood as tools of sense-making. So metaphors help us understand the complex or the confusing. Um, providers of digital music content use anachronistic music metaphors like libraries, folders, mixtapes, and radio to connect us to past affective states which makes music access online feel familiar, comforting, and enjoyable to many of us. Here I'd like to argue that these metaphorical ways of understanding access often actually increase confusion about musical value instead of helping us make sense of it. In particular, metaphors such as the stream and radio confuse us as to sources of musical labor. Providers of digital music content such as Spotify, Google Play, Tidal, Apple Music, Pandora, and others, they all depict music in ways that exaggerate music's complexity and supposed immateriality. So music has long been understood as immaterial. And here Jacques Attali in his book Noise from 1977 says, the political economy of music is unique. Only lately commodified, it soars in the immaterial. It is an economy without quantity. Music's supposed immateriality has always made it difficult to value. As Martin Stokes, an ethnomusicologist, puts it, music has historically been understood across many different cultures as a sort of secular religion. So it's corrupted by its contact with any commodity form. In other words, music and money, by definition almost, seem to exist in separate moral spheres, and they're not easily exchanged. Music for many of us is a kind of social warmth which offers relief from a mundane world of economics and money. So these views are widespread even more recently. Um, 
2014 Billboard article says, recommendation algorithms increasingly suggest everything we may want to watch, read, or buy. But what happens when that logic is applied to something as personal, unexplainable, and previously unquantifiable as music? So music is often mystified as something that we can't explain, and by extension, something that we find it hard to value or price. Paradoxically, it's music's extreme value to us, the way it seems to exceed value or its pricelessness, that enables it to be undervalued. And Martin Scherzinger calls this sideropia, a reverse process of alchemy, the process of gold becoming iron. This is the process by which something precious to us becomes worthless in a capitalist system. Musical sounds, in particular, in order to be priced, have to be attached to an object that we can more easily value. So a piece of sheet music, a vinyl record, an MP3 download, concert ticket, band t-shirt, etc. This process, apparently, is a full-time job. Um, this month, Spotify <laughs> is hiring a product owner in charge of monetization um, who can more efficiently monetize their products. And last night at the keynote talk, uh, Darius Kazemi mentioned the prevalence of the word delight in bot discourse, and so I was delighted to find that we have this. Um, so the goal is to more, the ultimate goal is to more efficiently monetize the products. Um, so the range of possible ways of doing this, of turning music into a commodified object that we can price, has resulted in providers appealing to a sort of confusing array of users' expectations and desires. In an effort to reduce the confusion and become more transparent, many providers make things more obscure. So Tidal, a hi-fi streaming service, has responded to demands for transparency by offering a sort of onslaught of charts and graphs trying to explain musical value. Um, Tidal knows that ethically they should be valuing music, which they foreground in their mission statement. Tidal believes in valuing music. Um, but they have no shame in admitting that for them, the destination of the newly added value isn't music, musicians or creators but actually uh, it loops back into incentivizing support for streaming itself. Um, let's see here. Early marketing strategies for streaming unanimously emphasized the volume of providers' musical libraries or collections. And this is an approach that I would say Spotify exemplifies. And even as of this month, the company aims for an exhaustive catalog of music. Um, their website currently reads, we are constantly adding albums and tracks to Spotify and want to offer our users all of the music in the world. <laughs> and I don't think that's going to load, but you can imagine. <laughs> that being said, providers have begun to diversify their tactics. So Spotify emphasizes now also democratic access. Ooh, that's not loading. That's okay. Um, it's not too important. So they emphasize uh, dem democratic access by claiming that they have music for everyone. Apple Music emphasizes a sort of futurity where they say that they offer users all of the music that they already have and even that which they might want in the future, implying that even if music were to continue to be created, it would still be in the user's possession, even though they don't actually, the users don't actually own it. Um, Tidal has a very unique approach of offering high fidelity streaming which emphasizes sound quality. So here their ads all function to promote their own service in addition to accompanying hi-fi gear that a listener would need to play back the sounds. And Pandora emphasizes user personalization in a model that's increasingly being adopted by all of the other providers as well. All of these approaches depict musical libraries as infinite and abundant and yet specialized and particular. They portray access to music as globalized and democratic, even as they promote techniques of appreciation, listening discrimination, and good taste, which necessarily stratify listeners into inevitably unequal social categories. Under capitalism, advertisers typically produce a lack in consumers that their products are designed to fill. So in the case of streaming, once listeners have all of the music in the world and more, um, they encounter what could be considered a tyranny of choice by which they need someone to help them dig through these stacks of music. And increasingly, providers suggest that the primary service they offer users is that of curation. Amidst a sea of musical content, we need someone to guide us. Um, and this quote, which I'll skip for time, um, speaks, this is an article from last month that speaks to this widespread view. Um, in effect, streaming providers offer us all of the music we could ever want and more, and then they charge us for help in wading through it. And this task can be 
performed by an algorithm, which is exemplified by EchoNest, which is a, a platform contracted by Spotify, Twitter, MTV, and some other music applications. Um, Pandora and Tidal emphasize the human labor behind their curation. So this is a recent job posting. Um, as a musicologist, I know Paul is a musicologist as well, this is like the only job outside of academia <laughs> that you can get. <laughs> um, so it's like the only one. Um, and in Apple, the case of Apple Music, you can actually pay Apple to do the curatorial work yourself. So you can be your own station manager. You can be your own boss. It sounds great. The logic of curation is that music should be there to accompany a listener in any situation or context across changing moods. So Spotify says, match any mood. Google Play tells us that there's music for working to a beat, boosting your energy, keeping calm and mellow. Mm -hmm. So like many products under capitalism, the streams offered by music services are advertised as soothing the anxieties produced by the stressful workday that the very same music facilitates. Mm -hmm. So in other words, music is there to help us work harder, to focus, to be more efficient, but it also helps us unwind after that long day of work. Taken one step further, it's widely known that providers such as Muzak, now known as Mood Music, intend to not only accommodate listeners' rapidly changing moods, but actually alter the affective states of the listeners. They promise here to teach businesses on the left, um, to teach businesses how to better use music to encourage increased consumption. And then on the right, emotional experience would seem to be universal in that everyone has some sort of emotion. <laughs> But the image on the right manages to link the concept of emotional experience, engagement, emotions, with this kind of vague notion of exclusive taste. And so I'd like to suggest here that streaming services, in foregrounding these various aspects of music and musical experience, obscure other, what I would consider more important aspects. And to return to Atali, he wrote in 2002, like Lent disguised as Carnival, the music industry is an instrument of social pacification. Um, it's a means of... Uh, a method of playing at fear, a trivial topic of conversation, and a means of preventing serious speech and action. It's not new news um, that when music becomes a form of mood modification, we begin to forget music's materiality. Our emergent preoccupation with taste making and curatorial techniques as a form of labor has led to a devaluation of other labors, namely musical performance. So I would say that focus on curation as a valuable form of work often obscures the content or object of that curatorial work. Music, meaning compositions, songs, recordings, live performances, which are also produced by their own type of labor. It's also not new news that streaming fails to fairly compensate musicians, songwriters, composers, and recording engineers. Journalists can't resist playing with the metaphor of the stream themselves when documenting a lack of compensation <laughs> to performing musicians. Representatives of freelance musicians have long resisted a passive stance to what they perceive as inequity. The Rethink Music Project associated with Berklee College of Music in Boston represents performing musicians of various genres of music. They recently published this 29-page booklet of fair music recommendations in the music industry. And they say, the current lack of transparency appears to benef benefit middlemen, but creators, consumers, and others in the value chain should no longer possibly accept this. And they give this list of recommendations, which uh, starts from entangling the increasing complexity um, and then goes on to uh, basically the overall goal is to educate uh, musicians about their rights as creators. And they say very little actually about what consumers should do, which maybe is a topic for the Q&A. So in conclusion, I've suggested that the metaphor of the stream emphasizes music's immateriality and seeming infinitude in ways that romanticize music and which make music appealing to listeners. But this metaphor, meanwhile, distorts and disguises flows of actual musical value. Precisely because music is so precious, we find it difficult to value and price. Currently, providers of digital music imagine a world in which music can be all things to all people. Abundant libraries of music are globally accessible to everyone, even as they must be specialized for each user. And this personalization is achieved through the foregrounding of curation as a valuable skill, which helps us wade through this ocean of options. But it's also by nature expressly designed to stratify listeners and exclude some. This emphasis on curation and on, and on music as a tool of mood management uh, sometimes has the effect of maybe even pacifying listeners. And meanwhile, those who create the musical materials that are streamed and curated outrightly resist metaphorical complexity in favor of transparency and simplicity. Musicians are telling anyone who will listen, 
If you continue to use us, you might use us up. Please remember to use the hashtag TTW16, hashtag B5, uh, for any questions and comments we're going to get to after Alexandra's presentation. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you very much for having me. I, I should say that I'm not an academic, so this is going to be a little more colloquial, but thank you for listening. Um, so for many, if not most people, it can be very frustrating to love music because you end up having to listen to a lot of artists who either hate you or just don't think you're a person. This goes for all genres, but today I'm going to focus on dad rock and its relationship with women because it's a subject that I can speak to and because dad rock artists have taken the least flack for everything they do wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and because I love dad rock. <clears throat> it doesn't love me back, but I've made my peace with that somewhat. Dad rock, of course, may well be a misnomer depending on the dad, Today I'm referring to mostly American and British rock music associated with dads, especially dads with kids old enough to think about what their dads listen to. So <coughs> Rolling Stones, The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Through to the Clash, and The Misfits, and beyond. I don't think I need to belabor the fact that rock culture is historically massively sexist, as well as massively racist and homophobic. It's exclusive and condescending to women when it's not outright aggressive and misogynistic but women have always loved rock music. I remember the time my best male friends played me the Misfits' last caress over the phone in elementary school, which, um, excuse me, lyrics have to do with, um, sh should I say the lyrics? Is that, <laughs> I, no? <laughs> should I? Should I? Should yes. I? Okay, I've got something to say. I, I raped your mother today. It doesn't matter much to me as long as she's spread. Anyways, um, it upset me. And I told them so, and of course they laughed at me because the song is meant as a joke, and when you complain, you become the joke. So like many girls, I absorbed that attitude and held on to it for years. But there comes a reckoning when you realize how much you put up with just to not be a bummer. You have to decide whether or not you can love music that hates you, and you have to decide for your own sake. And today I will listen to The Misfits gladly. A song like Last Caress, or Run For Your Life, or Under My Thumb is not a manifesto. It's meant to express a general attitude, not a particular sentiment, and an, a, an attitude for which women, of course, are props. In an essay from 1971, Ellen Willis describes how male groups, especially British ones, used women as scapegoats for their disenchantments with the class system. Mick Jagger punished spoiled rich girls, The Who punished girlfriends and wives for representing the establishment. But inasmuch as this music stood for revolt and personal liberation, or whatever, it spoke for women too, so you had to make do. As Alice Eccles writes in Scars of Sweet Paradise, her biography of Janis Joplin, the rock culture of those years was so profoundly masculine that the first time Rolling Stone paid any attention to women, it was in an issue devoted to groupies. Janis was exceptional, and she took a lot of BS for it. Eccles cites a rock writer who met Janis in a dive bar after her New York debut, her male bandmates having ditched her, as they did. The writer found her irritating and fantasized about shutting her down by saying, you forget you have acne. You could argue that the sentiments displayed in Dad Rock inspired a lot of excellent music and opposition, better music, I feel. Laura Nero, LaBelle, Dory Previn, X-Ray Specs, The Slits. I wouldn't call that its saving grace, but it does in a pinch. Groupiedom was, in some cases, a way to gain power through osmosis, and groupies certainly contributed to the history of rock music. But some of the cringiest parts of I'm With The Band are those in which Pamela De Barra longs for the success of her own group, the GTOs, the all-female act formed by Frank Zappa, which went nowhere. For the most part, groupies didn't get to own their accomplishments, and neither did the girlfriends and wives who inspired hit songs and nurtured their mates, often at their own peril, but were lucky to get off with a saleable memoir as they were written out of history. So knowing this, and with so many other better genres available, why do I love dad rock? Well, because it's good music. I mean, it's technically proficient, because dads often care about that sort of thing, but <laughs> also, I just love popular music, and at the end of the day, these guys were professional makers of pop music. 
I'm wary of this tendency to reduce people, especially artists, to the worst of their characters. I don't believe that bad ideas cancel out good ideas. They recontextualize good ideas, but it's up to the listener to decide whether they can still enjoy the work. Something I love about art is that it's a way for people to extract the best or most exciting parts of themselves in spite of their flaws, or to extract the best and most exciting parts of their flaws, intentionally or non. I like dad rock because it's good, but I also like it because it's bad. And it is bad. <laughs> politically bad, but the things that make it politically bad also warp it as art. Some of these warps are absolutely hideous, others are perversely compelling. Take Hall & Oates, for example. I love their songs for their merits, but I love Hall & Oates for the fact that they're silly and vulnerable for not having any idea of how silly they are. <laughs> Dad rockers are a silly bunch and this has been well documented. <laughs> it's difficult sometimes to read books by the women who knew the men of classic rock because many of them suffered for it. But these books are full of nice deflating minutia. Baby Buell's account of Todd Rundgren's paternalism and egomania paired nicely with the goofier tracks on Something Anything in his self-titled album from 1974. Pamela DeBar refers to David Crosby's pudgy body, always naked as he passed around humongous bowls of coke and pot. By Marianne Faithful's account, Bob Dylan wrote her a love poem and then tore it up like a petulant child when she rejected his advances. The arrogance is embarrassing and it doesn't make me like these men anymore as characters, but it adds a pathetic cast to their music that works for me like a grappling hook. <laughs> I can't relate, or I'd prefer not to relate to male arrogance, but I can relate to the pathetic. And part of what I love most about this music is the failure at its center, the unintentional critique of masculinity. As a friend says, it goes soft by trying too hard. <laughs> Foolishness is among the many flaws you might ascribe to this music, and it gives me a sense of relative power. What makes it easier to love someone like John Lennon, or Jim Morrison, or Neil Young, or Robert Plant, Jimmy Page is still sort of unforgivable, <laughs> is that we know things they don't, namely that they were wrong. They may have been geniuses, but they were also brats with huge moral impediments far beyond the ones referred to here. The clincher is that I don't have to go out and buy their records, or even pay attention to them beyond the songs that they, that they do that I love. If I buy a Bob Dylan record, it's coming from the dollar bin, and I feel no guilt about that whatsoever. Record collecting, I should say, in my opinion, is a questionable instinct. The goal is to find this rare, magic quality, take it home, and apply it to my life. The goal is to own it. And record collectors tend to buy used, spending huge sums of money that the artists will never see a cent of. I feel as though downloading music entails less of a sense of ownership, but as many have argued, listening to music in chopped up, playlisted form, suspended through your day-to-day -day can erase its context, which requires seriousness and care. Except with dad rock. We've been selectively ignoring its context for as long as dad rock has, ex has existed. On a good day, the music is hollow to me. I can fill it with whatever I like. I don't owe these musicians a thing, not even proper attention. I can chop up their work, play at any time, pair it with anything, and reduce it to background noise without doing any harm. It has never been easier to love this music without paying it any respect, attention, or money. <laughs> In sum, I treat dad rock the way dad rock musicians treated their groupies. I enjoy them. So we're going to take some questions. Thank you to our presenters. Um, how fitting on Record Store Day that we're here <laughs> talking about streaming and all the reissues of needless dad rock records on 180 gram vinyl. Uh, it's wonderful and no new bands can get a record made for like 12 months out or whatever. It's excellent. So I am sure you guys have great questions. Um, am I supposed to like MC this, like come out with a mic, and uh, I, I want to try that. I don't know if it'll reach you, but for our people at home, do you have a I question? Think I said I had a first. There. Yeah, I guess. Or just, Whatever it works. Yeah, there you go, if you don't mind. That, I think because we're streaming it, it might be helpful. Thank you. Cool. Um, so this question is for the last presenters. Um, all the talks were awesome, by the way. Thank you guys. So you were talking about how um, dad rock and this music that you kind of hates you, you really like it, and that you. Um, think that today's internet and streaming culture actually enables you to like it more, have a better relationship with it. I was thinking, um, because it takes a little bit of time and some mental work to grasp the nuances of why you might like music that initially makes you cringe, um, how that might work in the opposite way, because people don't may not have the attention span to grasp those nuances or see it in that context. 
Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I don't know if I have a good answer to it. Um, I do think, so I think there's a risk of, is that what you mean? There's sort of a risk of internalizing messaging that you don't really have the space to think through. Yeah, or that it could just be written off so easily based on one lyric or one particular perception of a, a hypermasculine or offensive image. Mm -hmm. Is that? What do you think, I mean, do you think, I guess the question would sort of, to me at least, boil down to whether it does harm. Because I think that there is, and I think that all of us in one way or another, regardless of what genre we like, you know, do make peace with a lot of music that contains messages that are objectionable or that are offensive to us personally. And I think there are ways in which this does do harm. Um, and the relationship one has with music is so intimate, um, you know, it's in your ear all the time, that there's a risk of it becoming toxic. At the same time, there's a way that you apply it into your life and sort of selectively ignore parts of it um, that, um, that I, I don't know if it negates that harm, but it, you end up absorbing it in a way where you sort of get the best parts without the bad. So I think, um, I think, I think it, Again, I don't really know if I have a good answer. I think it, it boils down to it boils down to the person and the relationship with the music. But speaking personally, I do find that being able to have music accessible in this way, and being able to have the music to the other thing is I sort of when I was sort of in my earlier twenties, I worked in record stores and knew a lot of people who were sort of hardcore record collectors, and they were almost always like older dudes. And there was this total reverence for like the object and the record and hunting down the record and having the record. Um, and I think sort of since I've been older and started listening to music more in sort of digital formats, um, the sort of lack of reverence or the sort of like ease I can have with the music and the way that I can sort of put it into my life without having to do that kind of like pilgrimage to the record store and sort of gossiping, like communications with the other people who sort of idolize this music, um, makes it feel more personal and sort of gives me a little more facility to sort of make it mine instead of, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. And we have another question back there. Would you mind coming up? Thanks. Thank you all for really great talks. Uh, this question is for the panel as a whole, but mostly for Elizabeth. Um, what should consumers do in this impossible <laughs> music time? Which I would follow up with is, has it ever been possible to purchase music ethically? <laughs> Elizabeth, you are. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I don't really know. Um, I mean, I'm curious what other people think as well. Um, I mean, I think a lot about ethics, and I do think we, I don't think we should just throw our hands up and say, well, you know, streaming's super convenient, and this is kind of, you know, we've always, it's always been unethical, so I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing in this sort of, like, mindless way. Um, I think there are arguments to be made that um, streamers, such as um, Tidal and maybe Spotify and others, are actually trying to respond to demands to be more ethical and to be more transparent about the value flows. Um, I mean, as it stands, 73% of streaming royalties go actually to labels. So I find that in researching this, in researching interviews with um, streaming providers themselves, they often sort of like deflect the responsibility for adequate compensation onto labels and say, well, it's these labels that are the problem, like the middlemen who are not then distributing profits appropriately to the musicians and artists that are working under them. Um, I know there are also like, and maybe you all know more about this. I know there are also like indie, um, like aggregators. So like there are, there's a, I think just like two or three main representatives that represent indie musicians, as like uh, a communicator or whatever the word is with um, with Spotify, for example. Um, so I think putting pressure on those people to more adequately compensate musicians is great. But I also think that as um, consumers who are sort of just like in the mix, I don't think that we are. Um, that we uh, lack, or that we don't have any responsibility. Um, I actually don't use Spotify. Um, I stream stuff on YouTube a lot, which I'm not sure is necessarily better, but I kind of like tell myself that it is in some weird way. But I think the best, I mean, I think of course it's always best to pay musicians directly and put the money right in their hands. And I think a lot of times people respond to that by saying, oh, well, like musicians don't really care. And I'm like, I don't know which musicians you're talking to because I know a lot of really struggling musicians and they always really appreciate it when you uh, buy, I think one good venue is maybe like Bandcamp, which I do think 
actually cuts out a lot of the stuff in the middle and actually does pretty, I think gives musicians 100%. Is there a, maybe there's a fee or something? Like that. Yeah. I can, I can. Um, yeah. As a musician, <laughs> um, the, I, I, I actually agree, Elizabeth, I think when you, when you see the band, um, live, that's the most money, the highest percentage you're going to be paying to that band will be seeing them live, where they're getting paid for that performance, and then purchasing from them directly at that merch table will be the most direct one-to-one uh, -one relationship, um, and all their costs will be covered. Uh, outside of that, you're going to get these, if um, my, the band I'm in is on a label called Relapse Records, so we get this kind of quarterly statement, and we get to see that, yeah, your YouTube play got us like a third of a penny that was awesome it's probably less than that but we get to see it we get this giant pdf and it's really long <laughs> like how many times you know but um honestly it's it's nice to know and it's also nice to know that the people that you work with are keeping track of this um, and i know that a lot of other bands that's kind of something that you you do wind up looking at um for that i guess like an economy of scale or whatever from the one-to-one -one of the live performance to what's happening with digital um, and, and whatnot. So it is kind of how it works, but if you're harder, maybe if you're a, a band that's not on a label, um, but then I think Bandcamp is an excellent way because you're getting that direct payment outside of maybe the, a fee for if you have more features on there, on the back end, um, and you know, if there is a physical object that you're selling, not just like a stream or both or whatnot. So that's great. We'll go right here. There you are. Um, I, I have another question about sort of like music streaming. Um, when I started using Spotify, I was so like tickled by these categories of like hipster brunch and like <laughs> and um, like rooftop cocktails. Um, and I, I started looking at these things and um, um, I'm revealing myself here, but one of my favorite tracks is this like celestial white noise um, thing that like is great when I can't fall asleep or um, when I need to like really focus on reading um, or writing and that I found that there's all these sort of like tracks that seem to issue from nowhere like there's no real artist and there's no like the artist will be like nature noises or so, something like that you know and I, I guess I was sort of um, I don't I really don't know anything <laughs> about how music is made or, or uh, about like um, streaming services so um, I was wondering like what what that does in terms of like um, authorship, or or maybe it's like a, a which came first thing, um, like these these categories or like this music, um, the noises and stuff like that. <laughs> I don't know. You know, does that make sense? Can I grab this and then maybe you throw it to you? Yeah. I'm sure, you have many thoughts about this too. Um, you talk about genres. Yeah. Too, so, yeah. I, is this on anymore? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna like move into my like, I you know I never feel more like a musicologist than when I'm like outside of musicological things. But I'll like move into musicology land um, and say that it's a, a particular like fascination the issue of sort of um, uh, parsing music in terms of its metadata, deciding who's the author of a piece of music, um, and the framework for doing that in streaming music is incredibly uh, unfriendly to say the kind of like Beethoven classical music um, that like has made up so much of my training as a musicologist um, that the paradigm really is to a sort of specific um, like musical object that is a sort of like pop music object that has one like nominal creator who of course is you know like Beyonce is a is an assemblage of a whole number of producers and, and lyricists and um, you know collaborative people, um, but that the the sort of single author ideal um, that the the singer performer is the author is the the person to whom this belongs um, means that a lot of that a lot of other kinds of music um, don't get sort of attributed in the way that we then understand music to have ownership, music to, to belong to or emanate from a person. Um, so yeah, this is a huge, huge deal in uh, classical music. Um, there are lots of huge deals with classical music. <laughs> um, well, yes, but, um, but that, uh, like, I, I think, I'm not sure if I'm responding to your question, but what your question is making me think of is the way that streaming services really sort of, sort of uh, refine what we, th or um, condense down what we think of as music 
into these, this very specific kind of object um, that, that has ownership and authorship and like duration um, in a very specific way that cuts out a lot of other possibilities for what music is. Yeah, I mean, I think on the same note, I think it's just like with streaming, like the example you give of some like ambient soundtracks or something like that, um, I think those are really interesting. And I think that they definitely kind of uh, make the author invisible, of course, because they're not giving an author. But at the same time, I think um, in other cases on the streaming platforms, they do really, really emphasize authorship when it sort of benefits them. Like, for example, um, I think Apple Music maybe is the best case where they, they're using like kind of star power to really value add value to their services, where they have, um, they recently bought Beats, I think, so it's like they have these partnerships with Jay-Z and Beyonce, et cetera, and so they're using these stars to sort of, I think, respond to our calls for, for greater transparency and ethical uh, music consumption, and they're like, no, how could we be unethical like Jay Z is doing just fine, <laughs> but then even like even in the chart that I, the, one of the charts from Tidal, for example, that I showed, um, it's kind of laughable. Where it's like if you actually look at the chart, it, it's basically like flaunting the fact that only one percent or less than one percent of musicians are making any sort of livable, remotely livable wage from these profit from the royalties. I think the. That again, when we get to the the bands who actually even successful bands and what they can make, and uh, it gets a little bit sad when you start to realize how much is being cut away by the services, the record company, the bills that they already have that are due for their promotions or whatnot, um, and to see what they actually make and end in popular bands that are doing very well and perform on nightly uh, television shows um, are sometimes still just kind of living this very you know hand to mouth existence, even when you think that they have this fame that's kind of laid out for them because of these kind of situations and uh, whatnot. I saw a hand over here. Great. I realized in one of yesterday's talks that um, Bitcoin's blockchain innovation is basically what could be used to get musicians and writers and creators of all kinds paid for their work, you know, because then it validates the original and then constantly tracks it. And you could constantly get this inflow of funds into your bank account. So is anyone working on this? <laughs> yes. Make it happen now. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I don't, I don't know much about this, honestly, but um, I do just, I know that in that report that I mentioned, even the Berkeley College report, the Fair Music recommendations, they actually had some stipulations, and just there's like a few paragraphs in there discussing Bitcoin and like cryptocurrency and such. So I, I don't honestly know what their exact recommendations are, but it's a topic. Of I'll just say there's a whole mailing list dedicated to this, which I could uh, hook you into. Oh, great. And I also would add to that, too, that I think sometimes um, there's been certain record labels uh, that, in the, that have actually, the kind of sharing of music, the free sharing of music, the legal download, they view it as a positive. And that there are bands who view it as the positive because that's a promotional tool. So even losing money on the, the music, the recorded music, and not even the object, uh, is acceptable. So tracing down it, sometimes I think, You'll even have, like there's um, a really good record label and they run a, uh, another company that tracks down the blogs that are posting the free downloads and like gets them to take it down. Um, but then there are record labels and bands who are like, well, that's like 100 people who won't come to the concert in whatever city, so why would we take it down? When we go there, we get our guarantee and we get a 20% after the door, like why would we do that? That's gonna be, that's all good in the end, even if we're not making that immediate money with be, it's not an object, but the file or whatever it is. So there's kind of that other side of maybe you wouldn't want to track it down because it's a promotional element, and when you make most of your money in that live setting, you know, you, are you undercutting that in some way? I don't know. Sure. Um, I wanted to go back to the topic of uh, music that hates you, and I was wondering um, if you find that to be a very internal process for you, or do you speak to others about that, and how do you engage in community around that, or maybe take the exhausting step of trying to convince men why that music is harmful, but the ways in which you can still enjoy it. So I was curious about like sort of, is it an introspective process that you know other people go through, or is it something that is like sort of a consistent discourse that you work around? Sure. Um, I think, 
I mean, I imagine that most people, most people who listen to music, period, in some way, but most people who listen to music who are female or have been marginalized in some way have to have that conversation with themselves or have to do that reconciliation. Um, personally, it feels internal, and in fact, like it's it's a little bit, it's a little hard to talk about with people because, you know, every woman has had a different experience of being a woman, and something might be difficult for somebody else that you've taken for granted or have even been callous about. Um, not necessarily callous, but there are things that you know that sit that that you can get over that other people have reasons that they can't. Um, so it feels like a conversation in a lot of ways that's best had among people. It's it's something that doesn't lend itself particularly well to at least Twitter or forums where people have to think quickly and condense very quickly. Um, but I think it's a really important conversation, and I think um, I think. These are sort of, like not only are they important conversations to have um, like within the context of a community or personally as a listener, but I think those conversations are a way of appreciating the work. Um, like it's a pretty important part of being a music fan to sort of understand what it means to you, what it meant in the world, what your relationship to these artists is. Um, and so uh, it becomes, I don't know, it's a conversation that works on, it's, it's a delicate conversation, but an important one that works on, I think, multiple levels, if that makes sense. Another question over here? Sure. Um, so I've seen this mostly in music, but it's probably like maybe applicable to video as well, but I noticed that musicians often are not involved in the technologies that determine like the future of their careers. So like Spotify was founded by computer scientists and like there there aren't that many artists as far as I know like on the Spotify team as of now. So I'm wondering like what artists can do in that context. Like should they just, they just like deal with it and then like let other people decide for them and then just go with the flow and like cope with that or can they also like build their own technologies to determine like where their careers are going and like do you know any examples of that? <clears throat> I don't think we should ask Neil Young how Pono went, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but do you want to add to that? My only, response is, my only response to this is really pessimistic. Um, I don't know, so maybe somebody else has the more optimistic response to this, um, is that um, like my sort of immediate like glib off the cuff response was like, well, like musicians should probably learn to code too while they're at it. Um, but this to me, I feel like is part, that, that glib response is part of this idea um, that a lot of musicians, both sort of classical conservatory trained and um, you know, the sort of uh, gigging pop musicians are um, in like contemporary capitalism, uh, supposed to be these sort of multi flexible entrepreneurs who like, they're not just supposed to be musicians, they are supposed to be um, incredibly savvy on Facebook, and they're supposed to be able to, like, produce and edit their own YouTube videos for their YouTube channel that, of course, is netting them, like, you know, fractions of pennies every month, and is netting YouTube more than fractions of pennies every month. <laughs> um, and that, like, so, you know, I, I guess, I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely resistant to your question, and I would love to, like, ha come up with a brilliant sort of utopian strategy for, um, musicians as musicians to sort of find a, a, a workspace that works for them. But I feel like the answer that I'm most inclined to give is that, oh, well, musicians also need to be able to do more things. They need to sort of um, have this sort of uh, multi-tentacled entrepreneurial ability uh, that just sort of slots them, in my pessimistic view, ever more into the sort of like nets of uh, contemporary capitalism. So. Uh, I don't know, please them and say something more optimistic than that. I, I mean, I share, the, I share the pessimism, unfortunately. I mean, I think this is a really important point, this idea that musicians are, like, in line with music being sort of immaterial and compared to other, comparison with other commodities. It's like we have this idea that music is exceptional in a lot of ways, and I think that trickles down Sorry, <laughs> to the um, the level of like entrepreneurship, where it's like you would never expect probably a chef who has this kind of specialized, distinctive skill of being a chef in a restaurant. You would never expect them to be doing all of these other um, related activities, perhaps that um, that like secure their employment and and payment. 
And in the same way, it's like if you ask someone like who who uses music streaming services or who pirates music, and this is an old argument, but I'm just bringing it up because I think it's important st still. Um, it's like maybe cliche, but it's like you would never you would never st like steal food from a restaurant, but you might easily. M most of us probably have pirated music, and I think the logic there is that it's like oh, you know, food is like a real thing. But then whenever I talk to a friend, I'm like, yeah, but you eat it and then it's gone. Like, <laughs> and, and it's like, and then you like, and, and then it's gone. And so it's like, I don't think that it's actually, <laughs> it's, it, once you start really parsing it out, it's like with these sort of thought experiments, it's like music actually isn't maybe that much different, but we sort of allow ourselves to think that it's really exceptional um, because it makes it easier. And we just don't want to have to pay for it is the bottom line. Like, but I'm not sure that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> question right there. Sure. Yeah. You, want, you can shout it, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I don't feel like yeah. 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 You just hit on something really important, which is I think that when we're talking about like musicians and the internet and how we can make platforms that better serve musicians, um, and think about like how to get to a place where there are musicians involved in the conversation of what the platforms look like where we're sharing our music and um, how to make them like more in line, especially when we're thinking about independent artists, like more in line with the politics of independent artists. Um, what you said about musicians learning to code and musicians like teaming up with people who have like these skills and these tools to make platforms that are like more reflective of like what musicians like actually want, like that's like totally in my perspective like um, like a really important part of the conversation. And there is this organization called Cash Music based in the Pacific Northwest that is like team a team of musicians and coders who are working on open source software for musicians that would enable them to like make their own they don't take any money at all i was wondering if you're familiar with cash music at all or any of these projects to like team up musicians and coders to work on tools together no but i think that you absolutely did the thing that i was hoping that you you sort of transformed my, uh, <laughs> so uh, rather than uh putting the onus on the musicians um to sort of become everything um uh, for free in the hopes of making money someday. Um, that like collaboration as a strategy um, seems uh, yeah a lot more productive than than my pessimism. Um, I haven't heard that, but I'm gonna check it out. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Although I was gonna say as a musician, I don't know where the time comes to learn how to code yeah. and like write the music and like you know be a social being and like have your family and all that stuff. Like now I gotta code this thing. Oh man, a lot of stuff. Go ahead. I'll, I'll sure. I, I just kind of going off of that, and I'm curious what you guys think. Is I feel certain, and maybe some other folks do as well, an anxiety around that idea and the idea of collaborations between artists and coders and whatever it is, especially in the sense that it just further kind of enmeshes art and the creation of art in the logics of capitalism and and kinds of materiality that that do. You know, as much as they may contribute to the the you know ability of artists to survive, that also kind of reduce art and the creation of art again to just another sort of labor for the creation of surplus value or whatever it is. So, I mean, it seems like, or, or how would we feel about kind of broadening the conversation to like a more macro level where it's not just it's not just artists and creators of content that need to escape the sort of bonds of, of you know wages and wage labor but then we all we sort of we have to move everybody beyond that and you know I'm not sure just I only bring it up just because I'm not sure how great it is in the long term to tie those things up even more tightly than they already are especially since like YouTube is broke. Like YouTube doesn't make any money. YouTube only makes money because it's owned by Google and Google's share price goes up. Like YouTube has never made any money. So these things it's like it's not like a foregone conclusion that you build a service and you get some artists and coders together and they're gonna be able to make some money. It's like really hard to do that. And you just wind up tying it all back up in this massive. So Yeah, I mean I think that's kinda of yeah, so the artists, yeah, I think that link is an important thing to, this, to, to address. Um, do you just want to add anything to that? Go ahead, sure. Yeah, I, I share the anxiety. You're saying you have that anxiety. I do. Yeah, I share the anxiety. I mean, I tend to be very old school and kind of like, I don't know, like I'm kind of a curmudgeon where it's like I, I don't, 
really stream music that much. It's like I buy, I mostly buy CDs and tapes from musicians. I don't actually own that much music. And I, I don't necessarily, I mean, I, I, I want to like advocate that and like only buy music literally from the bands that you like or within reason or something. But I don't, I mean, I don't think that's a viable recommendation for the industry at large because I understand that it's like, that's a, that is a naive view that I hold and that um, in the larger world, I think that it does behoove us to think about, you know, these, maybe these more optimistic platforms where they, there are people that have some interest and energy that they're willing to commit to collaborating between these different spheres. Um, I, sh I mean, I definitely share the anxiety that further enmeshing seems to kind of like reify or whatever to continue with the Marxist language, like reify these um, like harmful systems. Um, yeah, so I think, it's, I, think, I think in terms of like action to take, it's like kind of a balancing act where if we're all conscious of what we're doing and then making the most of what we can with these, um, these other options for collaboration and thinking about how to do that ethically. And we have time for maybe one more question. If anybody has another question, we've had some good stuff so far. All right, great, right up front. <laughs> I don't know if you want to use this or not, you can. Um, no, I think I'm okay. okay. Right. I'm close okay. enough. <laughs> okay. Um, I had a question. If, I was wondering if any of you had any thoughts about why certain older forms of m music piracy have kind of like remained enshrined in myth or romanticized in a way like in the public imagination they're viewed largely positive and I'm, I'm thinking of like live tapes of Grateful Dead shows or even just the act of like making a mixtape from the radio and I wonder if like the reason that we continue to view those more positively like is that just because there was a larger like net loss for the artist because acquiring that required more labor from the person and it was less ubiquitous or if there's like something else at play um, and the reason why those like older forms of piracy are kind of like viewed really nostalgically and positively. Home taping is killing the music industry. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, there's a whole like a whole. I will try not to say a whole thing about um, the the idea of sort of like liveness and authenticity. But I think both of the things that you mentioned um, were very tied up with liveness, which has this whole like which is tied into. Um, a lot of what Elizabeth's been saying about um, music as imagined as this sort of uh, like immaterial thing, um, right? So that like pinning down that liveness is its whole own um, like highly elevated uh, like discourse of you know. So so that there's a there's a sort of authenticity in that that like um, doesn't exist in you like ripping a terabyte of you know, whatever <laughs> yeah. you're doing, right? That there's there's no there's no like aura, there's no sort of magical presence of, of your like participation in that event, um, which is you know I feel like in some ways the um, the like making a mixtape from the radio has a similar valence to like going through going to the the record store and like you know, flipping through vinyl, right? There's a sort of like curation and attention that's there um, that you have to, you know, you have to be there participating and like paying attention so you can hit start and stop at the right time. Um, so yeah, this sort of like idea of like the labor of the, the listener, the fan that's happening here um, is embedded in that definitely. <laughs> I love tapes, uh, and, <laughs> but I think that I think that's right. That kind of this liveness of the object, or I also think that this nostalgia arises from our frustrations with the current era. That we're kind of like we're faced with this perplexing situation of this digital or streaming, or who's paying for these ethics, and so our there's this reaction of like it's reactionary, it's conservative. The object is the is the valued thing. So it's going to be record store day or cassette store day or whatever. <laughs> there is one, uh, you know. And I think that, uh, and I met, a, I met, a, I was at the Baltimore uh, Open Space Prince and Multiple Fair last weekend, and there was this table of uh, this really nice guy, and he was selling uh, bootlegs tapes for two dollars of bands like Total Control and like, all these really cool bands. And I was like, two bucks, that's great, you know? <laughs> I don't know what it sounds like. I don't think the quality's gonna be very good. But it was, you know, I think that there is this like reaction of like, I'm just not gonna mess with this and I'm gonna make this tape for this or I'm gonna stick to vinyl, but I think vinyl's obviously kind of come with these caveats, but I think sometimes that nostalgia arises out of this frustration with the current situation. So instead of dealing with it, 
we kind of resort to like, well, that's worked in the past or something. But at the same time, tapes are pretty great and records are really great. <laughs> Also, sort of, I don't know, at least when I think about tapes or trading or bootlegs or whatever, I think of it as something supplemental to the actual material. Um, it's not something that you could get, up, that you could pay for otherwise in a lot of cases. And also, there's the matter of the community, and maybe like the community at the expense of the artist. Like certainly sort of tracking down rarities or like having the kinds of relationships that you form with people who love a band enough to sneak in a tape recorder and distribute it. Like, I do, I think people are more nostalgic for that than anything else, the sort of like, yeah. Well, that is our time. <laughs> That's our time. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I need to.